South Asia is a region of contrasts. Some nations will be fixated with security and financial concerns, yet others will find themselves in the center of a geopolitical chessboard with Russian, Chinese, American and Indian pieces moving all over the place. Meanwhile, local politicians will seek to exploit the growing nationalist sentiment to advance their own political agendas. This and more we will go over in the 2017 analysis for South Asia. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Check out our Patreon feed for additional content and for ways to support the channel. Managing the affairs of India is a colossal task. For Modi and the ruling Indian People's Party, or BJP for short, 2017 represents an opportunity. Earlier this year, India held seven state elections in which the ruling party won with a massive majority. Currently, the BJP forms the majority in the lower house of the parliament, but no one controls the upper house. The lack of a majority in the upper chamber has proven to be a major obstruction in the ruling party's efforts to introduce reforms. However, unlike the direct election of lower house members, the upper house is elected by state assemblies. Every year, a select number of people retire from the upper chamber and following this, state bodies elect new representatives to replace them. Meaning, even with Modi's victory in the latest state elections, gaining a majority in the upper house is a long-term objective. It implies that the prime minister must continue to win state elections and gradually earn additional seats in the upper house. If successful, Modi will be able to streamline the necessary reforms for the Make in India initiative, which we explained in an earlier report. In the immediate future, Modi must find ways to pass legislations within the plural upper chamber. One crucial reform that is likely to pass in 2017 is the Goods and Services Tax, or GST for short. In late 2016, several GST-related bills were delayed due to the demonetization campaign and in this context, Modi's primary concern for 2017 is to make sure that the remaining GST bills pass. Following the legislations, New Delhi can focus on introducing a value-added tax and eliminate some of the bureaucratic regulations. In essence, the GST will enhance the internal movement of goods and services, which in turn will lower the manufacturing costs and boost domestic consumption in India. Another development that will continue to shape South Asia is the rising nationalist sentiment in Pakistan and India, which will peak in August 2017 when both nations mark their 70-year anniversaries of independence. To that end, skirmishes and cross-border raids in Kashmir, accompanied by political rhetoric, are likely to transpire. For the local people, emotions will run high as they exchange blame, yet for officials in Islamabad and New Delhi, the nationalist attitudes are calculated political decisions. For Prime Minister Modi, the unrest in Kashmir is an opportunity to blame Pakistan and rally Hindu nationalists which form his support base. Meanwhile, for Prime Minister Sharif, the tensions in Kashmir are a pretext to preserve civilian control over Pakistan's foreign and military policies. The situation will be especially tense for Pakistan. The nation will start preparing for the 2018 general elections. Sharif will start his political campaign for a fourth term. Therefore, to prove his credibility, he will have to take a tough stance against India, especially during the summer months. The mixture of ceremonies, elections and nationalism will produce a precarious environment in South Asia. Nevertheless, neither side wants to go to war. Therefore, despite tensions, skirmishes and cross-border raids, officials in Islamabad and New Delhi will find ways to restrain themselves. In Pakistan, the government faces an abundance of security concerns. For instance, in the West, the Taliban insurgency will continue to force thousands of Afghan refugees into Pakistan. Meanwhile, in the East, India will remain the biggest security risk. 
At the same time, the recently appointed Chief of Army Staff, General Bajwa, will find himself at the center of Pakistan's political landscape. As Pakistani-Indian tensions are bound to peak in the summer, security concerns could force General Bajwa to repeat history and intervene in the civilian government. It's also entirely possible that the Chief of Army Staff will abstain from politics and simply abdicate power after his term. As of this writing, it's too early to say what will happen, as both scenarios remain in the realm of possibilities. In Bangladesh, the government will struggle to maintain stability amidst a changing neighborhood. For one, the refugee crisis of the Rohingyas from neighboring Myanmar is pushing the capabilities and resources of the authorities in Dhaka. Additionally, national enforcement agencies will continue to work overtime to combat the local ISIS and Al-Qaeda groups, which will seek to target Bangladeshi bloggers, secularists and civil activists. On top of everything, Dhaka will find itself at the center of the Chinese-Indian geopolitical rivalry. For instance, in 2016, China pledged to invest up to $24 billion in the infrastructure of Bangladesh. As a countermeasure, India is likely to step up its neighborhood first policy, which seeks to increase inter-regional trade in South Asia and thus reduce China's influence. Meaning in 2017 and onwards, New Delhi will expand its financial investments in Bangladesh. The rivalry between India and China also extends into Sri Lanka where Beijing's economic influence has grown substantially following the defeat of the Tamil Tigers in 2009. Over the years, China has fiercely invested in the local transportation and logistical projects, the port of Hambantota being a prime example. In the coming years, India's Neighborhood First initiative will explore investment opportunities in Sri Lanka, such as the Transportation Rehabilitation Project. Yet, the island's complex political landscape, which includes the Sinhalese majority and the Tamil minority, will force New Delhi and Beijing to navigate with caution. Elsewhere in South Asia, the situation has decayed in Afghanistan. The central authority in Kabul has declined due to President Ghani and Chief Executive Abdullah's failure to implement any of the electoral reforms. As a result, the parliament has been unable to pass legislations, and Abdullah is unlikely to serve as the prime minister, which will further divide the Afghan government in 2017. To that end, a divided government will also fail to implement other reforms that are necessary to strengthen governance, the military, and broaden the tax base. Basically, the political failures have created an environment in which the Taliban insurgency has revived itself. For instance, some Taliban factions such as the Haggani Network, Mullah Dadu La Front, and Fidai Mahaz made significant gains on the ground. Meanwhile, the Afghan ISIS has sought to escalate sectarian violence by targeting Shiite Muslims. As such, in 2016, violence reached the highest level since the United Nations started recording incidents in 2007. The revival of insurgents has ignited a new refugee crisis in Afghanistan. Thousands of civilians are fleeing the country and seeking refuge in neighboring countries. In the meantime, the refugee crisis was made worse when the European Union decided to deport an estimated 80,000 asylum seekers back to Afghanistan. All of these mentioned trends will continue to devastate the country in 2017. For the Americans, the situation in Afghanistan is a no-win scenario. In fact, Washington's objective now is not to defeat the Taliban, but to settle a deal with the insurgents and thus restore American reputation. However, reaching an understanding with the Taliban is a tedious process. At the present, the main obstruction is the division within the insurgency. For instance, the Taliban's Doha faction has shown willingness to transform from an insurgency into a viable political party. The fact of the matter is that Afghanistan's diverse political landscape cannot be exclusively governed by one faction. Whether it's the Taliban, parliamentary members, civil activists, religious figures or Afghan women, the only feasible solution to a stable Afghanistan is a system of power sharing, as seen in many other ethnically diverse countries.
The Doha faction is receptive to such a proposal and has requested to open a formal office on Afghan soil as a precondition for further talks. Yet the authorities in Kabul are reluctant to concede political power to the insurgency. Even more opposition to reconciliation can be found among the more zealous Taliban factions, who have formed splinter groups or have merged with a local ISIS branch. Over the course of 2017, the Taliban's internal divisions will become more apparent and further impede the negotiations. The circumstances in Afghanistan become even more complicated when one adds the Russians and Indians to the equation. For instance, Russia wants the United Nations to drop sanctions against certain figures in order to promote a peaceful dialogue with the Taliban. What's more is that Moscow believes that the traditional Taliban factions are a necessary force against the Afghan ISIS. This position is shared by China and Pakistan. On the other hand, however, the government in Kabul, backed by India, strongly opposes the notion of negotiating with terrorist groups as they believe it will strengthen Pakistan's political power in Afghanistan. For this reason, New Delhi and Kabul are facilitating efforts to deny safe havens and sanctuaries to the Taliban in Afghanistan. So given the contradicting initiatives by major players, a basic resolution for Afghanistan is unlikely to be reached in the immediate future. Further north in Central Asia, most of the countries will find themselves in uncharted territories as they will be preoccupied to secure stability amidst political transitions. For instance, the 76-year-old President Nazarbayev is trying to concede power from his office to the parliament in order to secure a stable government in Kazakhstan. Yet, Nazarbayev's succession efforts also present an opportunity for the political elite. As such, Kazakh oligarchs will target their associates in hopes to expand their influence and power in the energy and financial sectors. The situation is more pressing in other parts of Central Asia. In Tajikistan and Uzbekistan, the authorities will try to maintain power by cracking down on dissidents. The level of repression is likely to exceed that of the previous years. As low-intensity conflict emerges in Central Asia, Moscow and Beijing are likely to intervene in the domestic affairs of the region. In such a scenario, Russia is likely to extend military support to Uzbekistan, while China is expected to offer financial support to Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan. Basically, in 2017, instability will determine the trends in Central Asia, whereas South Asia, apart from India, will remain as divided as ever. This was a Caspian report by me, Shirvan. I want to thank the following people for their contributions on Patreon. And later this month, we will hold a live session exclusive on Patreon. So for more information, check out our fundraising page on patreon.com slash caspianreport. In any case, thank you for your time and so on.